Good morning. This is Ron. It is Friday, uh, May the 18th. Welcome to Storytime. Okay, so uh, it's uh, 9.45 here in California, Pasadena, California, and I've just been uh, heard on the radio on Rush Limbaugh's show, as a matter of fact, that uh, there's been another school shooting in Texas, Santa Fe, Texas. And so I uh, wanted to reiterate that this becomes and is a uh, school problem. It's an individual school, each school has the responsibility for making sure that the students that go to that school are safe. And also, parents ultimately have bear the responsibility for their own children and making sure that the schools that they're putting their children in are safe or that have at least um, personnel and programs put in place to uh, maximize the safety of the children and to deal with active uh, shooter situations. So the parents should be looking for whether or not the school has uh, guards or police officers on duty, and again, whether or not there are uh, procedures in place to uh, be able to uh, protect the children when and if there is an active shooter in place. Other than that, I pray for the uh, victims of uh, this school in Santa Fe, and we'll uh, find out uh, later uh, more details on it. The other thing I wanted to say was it occurred to me this morning while I was listening to uh, Rush Limbaugh was the uh, student, uh, or the organized uh, student um, protests that happened over the last uh, school shooting. And what occurred to me was that there, uh, the, the left in general, but in, in particular this student uh, so-called movement, was uh, really uh, instrumental in doing nothing else other than whining. They really did nothing. It's not a movement of any of any importance. It's just a movement to get your face on television and to whine, whine and complain. And I thought uh, there's other things that these students could have done that could have made an impact, uh, that could have. Um, put themselves in a position to prove their leadership and their leadership skills. Because if you're going to come to me and say that you claim that you're a leader and uh, demand that I follow you, then you're going to have to uh, uh, show to me that you are uh, a, that you have leadership skills and that you're acting in good faith. The students could have and should have done is go right home because I'm wondering and I'm guessing that uh, many of those students, but I'm wondering how many students have guns at home that probably don't belong to the students, because most of these uh, students, if not all of them, were high school students. Uh, but um, how many of these students have guns at home Their parents that their parents own? Why didn't the students? Because they could have had an immediate and dramatic uh, effect uh, by simply going home and going to each house. They could probably organize, get all the students together and go from house to house and go to each house and demand that the parents surrender their guns uh, to law enforcement authorities and that the law enforcement authorities then uh, destroy those weapons. They could have done something like that. That would have been a uh, much better uh in terms of demonstrating true leadership, uh, right now all it show all they're showing is the propensity to be a um, to to, uh, to push people around to boss to be bossy. We demand you do this. We demand you do that. But they're not willing to do the very things that they're demanding of other people. That's what you're going to notice with a lot of left wing people in your life. Uh, uh, whether they're relatives, friends, or co-workers, or even the odd stranger now and again, is that the, one of the hallmarks, one of the easiest way to tell whether or not somebody is left is their propensity to boss people. 
uh, there's a lady I know that uh, I've known for oh, seven, ten years, and uh, that's what she does. All of her relationships are based on bossing. And I don't mean just giving the odd piece of advice. I mean, she literally tells people what to do and then follows up. Did you do what I told you to do yesterday? You should do X, Y, Z. Did you do it? And if you don't, she gets upset. She gets irritated, annoyed, and angry because you didn't do what she told you to do. It's uh, this kind of uh, faux leadership is compassion on the cheap. If you're told constantly you have to be compassionate, have to be compassionate, but you really don't want to put the, quote, skin in the game. You don't want to put the money, time, and energy in, that it requires to be truly compassionate. Well, one way you can fake it is by bossing people around. Then you can say, well, you know, I'm compassionate because I'm concerned about other people. I care about those people around me. Well, no, you really don't, because if you did, you'd put some skin in the game. Because it's one thing if somebody wants to say, hey, Ron, I noticed X, and let me help you by doing such and such. Let me either give you money, let me give you time, let me give you energy in order to help you with this particular problem. That's, that's different than just saying, hey, Ron, you know, you ought to do X, Y, Z. I have a couple of, for instance, I have a couple of vehicles. And uh, this uh, lady wants to wants me to sell one of them. She's convinced that that would be uh, what would be best for me. I should sell the vehicle. And so periodically she checks to see whether or not I've sold it. And then if I haven't, then she's uh, she scolds me about it. So this is the this is the left and its uh, version of leadership because nobody on the left really, like I said, really wants a revolution. They really don't want socialist paradise. They just go through the motions because they've been bullied and intimidated by others, by their, by their relatives, by their friends, into going along with the program. So they got to put on a show. they got to put on a mask and make it look like they're a good socialist when in uh, reality they're not. So uh, when I uh, come back, it, uh, I'm going to be reading uh, from a, a new book that I just got. And it's uh, called The Black Book of the American Left. Okay, I'm back, and again, I'm going to be reading uh, from The Black Book of the American Left by David Horowitz. He's got several volumes to this, but uh, basically what it is is his sort of his life story, and um, what's interesting, you hear Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity at all, and they're always talking about the left as though they know what they're talking about, which uh, 99% of the time they don't. They haven't bothered to do any research. They really don't understand the philosophical and uh, cultural nuances involved in uh, socialism or capitalism for that uh, matter. And the people that you can really learn something about uh, socialism from, it's not the socialists themselves because they're prone to, ha they, they believe that the ends justify the means and might makes right. So they're uh, willing to lie, cheat, or steal in order to get their way. So, but the, the people you can learn from are ex-socialists. Uh, one of them is Tammy Bruce. That's why I say, if you really want to listen to a good talk show, listen to Tammy Bruce. Skip Rush, skip Sean, uh, skip uh, all the rest of them, listen to Tammy Bruce. She was uh, used to be a lefty, she was a feminist, and she's got all the insight as to uh, the history and uh, the tactics and techniques of the left, uh, particularly as it applies to feminism. So uh, I'm going to be reading right now from uh, the premise, or the preface, excuse me, to the Black Book of the American Left. The idea for these volumes came about as the result of a self-inventory undertaken to map the development of my political views over the last 30 years. This inquiry involved a survey of all the articles and essays I had written as a conservative. Since the day Peter Collier and I published a cover story in the Washington Post magazine announcing our second thoughts about the left and our departure from its ranks. 
These writings, which were assembled with the indispensable help of Mike Bauer, added up to more than 690 articles and essays and a million and a half words. Some were lengthy considerations of big issues, other reactions, others reactions to current events, and some were polemical responses to political opponents. But when I had looked over this body of work, I realized that virtually everything I had written was really about one subject, the American left. The ancient Greek poet Archilochus was the author of a philosophical fragment that became the focus of a famous essay by the writer Isaiah Berlin, which he called The Hedgehog and the Fox. In this fragment, Archilochus observed, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. For whatever reason, in the many years I have been a writer, I've never been a fox. It is true that my subjects have been varied, and I've been even authored two volumes of philosophical reflections about mortality and life, but the primary focus of my work, even of those thoughts on mort mortality and existence, has remained one big thing, the nature, deeds, and fortunes of the political left. The first part of my life was spent as a member of the New Left, and its communist predecessor, in which my family had roots. After the consequences of those commitments became clear to me in the mid-1970s, I came to know the left as an adversary, and if sheer volume were the measure as its principal intellectual antagonist, some have seen an obsession in my efforts to define the left and analyze what it intends. In a sense, that is true. I had left the left, but the left had not left me. For better or worse, I have been condemned to spend the rest of my days attempting to understand how it pursues the agendas from which I separated myself and why. When I was beginning this quest nearly three decades ago, I paid a visit to the New York intellectual Norman Potteritz, who had his own second thoughts a decade earlier, though not from so radical a vantage as mine. Potteritz asked me why I was spending my time worrying about an isolated community on the fringes of politics. I should focus, he said, on liberals, not leftists. This advice reflected what seemed an accurate description of the political landscape at the time. Many would have seconded his judgment when the walls of communism came tumbling down shortly thereafter. But the progressive faith is just that, a faith. And despite the exceptions of individual cases, no fact on the ground will dispel it. When Potter Horitz and I met, progressives and radicals had already escaped the political ghettos to which my parents' generation had been reasonably confined. The massive defeat they suffered in the fall of the Marxist states they helped create had the ironic, unforeseen effect of freeing them from the burden of defending them. This allowed them in the next decade to emerge as a major force in American life. In the wake of the communist collapse, this left has become a very big thing, so big that by 2008, it was the dominant force in America's academic and media cultures, had elected an American president, and was in a position to shape America's future. Because of its post-communist meta met metastasis, what Norman Potteritz once saw as a parochial interest in a fringe cause has become an effort to understand the dominant development in America's political culture over the last 50 years. That is the subject of these volumes. The essays contained herein describe the left as I have known it, first from the inside as one of its theorists, and then as a nemesis confronting it with the real-world consequences of its actions. In all these writings, I was driven by two urgencies, a de desire to persuade those still on the left of the destructive consequences of the ideas and causes they promoted, and second, the frustration I experienced with those conservatives who failed to understand the malignancy of the forces mobilized against them. Most conservatives habitually referred to leftists who were determined enemies of America's social contract as liberals. In calling them liberals, conservatives failed to appreciate the Marxist foundations and religious dimensions of the radical faith or the hatreds it inspired. And they failed to appreciate the left's brutal imp imposture in stealing the identity of the intellectual pragmatic patriotic, anti-totalitarian, Cold War liberals whose influence in American political life they began killing off in 1972 with the McGovern coup inside the Democratic Party. 
When this syllabus of my conservative writings was finally assembled and I had read their contents through, I realized that even though they would take up multiple volumes, they added up to a single book, which my colleague Peter Collier quickly christened the Black Book of the American Left. A flattering allusion to the Black Book of Communism, the authoritative 1997 work by several European academics outlining the terror and catastrophe created by communist states. Contained in these volumes is a diary written over more than half a century, what describes one man's encounters with a movement which, in the words of its most prominent figure, Barack Obama, is seeking to fundamentally transform the United States of America. The diary records the progress of that transformation, documenting the changes of a shape-shifting movement that constantly morphs itself in order to conceal its abiding identity and mission, which, as these pages will make clear, is ultimately one of destruction. It is also almost a certainty that no other book will be written like this one, since it can only have been the work of someone born into the left and condemned Ahab-like to pursue it in an attempt to comprehend it. Yet this is not so much a project of monomania, as my adversaries will undoubtedly suggest, but a discovery, an attempt not only to understand a movement, but to explore its roots in individual lives, including my own. While I hope this book may be useful to those fighting to defend individual freedom and free markets, I do not deceive myself into believing that I have finally set the harpoon into the Leviathan, a feat that is ultimately not possible. Progressivism is fundamentally a religious faith, which meets the same eternal human needs traditional faiths do, and for that reason will be with us always. In the last analysis, the progressive faith is a Gnosticism that can only be held at bay, never finally beaten back to earth. And there's a footnote here. One consequence of this was the large number of conservatives who voted in 2008 for Barack Obama, a man whose political outlook was shaped in the same radical crucible as mine, first communist, then new left. Exit polls reveal conservatives abandoned McCain. Newsmax, November 9, 2008. On Obama's career in the radical left, see Stanley Kurtz, radical in chief. And uh, that is the conclusion of the uh, preface to uh, the book called the, the Black Book of the American Left. So um, I look forward to, to reading this with you, and I think it's going to be um, a very insightful, uh, and it's going to be able to show much better uh, than Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity or the rest, um, exactly what goes on with the left, how they think, and how they operate. So when I come back, I'm going to be doing the uh, New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book. Okay, we're back, and uh, I'm reading uh, selections from the New York City Cab Driver's Joke Book. Let's see. A busy executive goes to the doctor for a complete physical. The doctor explains, we have a new computer uh, that, with only urine specimen, can tell us everything that is wrong with you. Great, says the executive. Let's do it. The doctor gives the man a beaker. He goes into the men's room and comes out with a full container. The doctor then pours its contents into the computer. The computer begins to click and buzz and make strange sounds. After less than a minute, it stops and issues a long computer printout. The doctor picks it up and is studying it for a long time. Finally, the man says, What is it, Doc? Am, am I all right? According to this, says the doctor, you're in fine shape except you have tennis elbow. But that's impossible, says the man. I don't play tennis. I don't even play golf. I don't do anything like that. Well, the doctor replies, the machine is never wrong. At least it's never been wrong yet. But I'll tell you what I'll do. Take this sterilized jar home with you tonight. Urinate into it tomorrow. First thing in the morning, bring it in, and I'll run it through the computer once again, free of charge. How does that sound? Fair enough, says the man. As the executive is driving home, he starts to think about the diagnosis and begins to get very angry about how computers are taking over the world. 
By the time he gets home, he's decided that he's going to fix that computer. He gets out of his car and pisses a little into the jar. Then he takes the dipstick out of his engine and swishes it around in the urine. Then he tells his wife and daughter about all of this and has them both urinate into the jar. Finally, the next morning before leaving home, he goes out behind a tree in his backyard and masturbates into the jar. He then drives into town, chuckling to himself. How are you this morning, asks the doctor as he sees the man coming in. Fine, Doc, he laughs. You seem to be in good spirits, says the doctor as he pours the specimen into the computer. Once again, it begins to click and buzz, and in less than a minute, out comes a long piece of paper. As the doctor studies it, the executive says, So, Doc, what does it say today? Well, answers the doctor, according to this, your car needs an oil change, your daughter is pregnant, your wife has gonorrhea, and your tennis elbow is never is going to get a lot worse if you don't stop jerking off like that. And that is uh, that's the conclusion of today's episode of Story Time from your host, who is the only true conservative in the United States of America. Till next time, have a great day.